Hello, everyone. Hello, hello, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us once again for uh, Between Two Psalms. Uh, I'm Master Sommelier Jesse Becker with Craft and Estate Imports at Winebow. Uh, we're mainly a, a French uh, portfolio with some great wines from Austria and Greece, uh, but uh, I have a real passion for Italian wine. And when people ask me uh, what are some of the wines that I love drinking at home, I always say Chianti Classico. It's just one of my absolute favorite wines to drink. And I'm always very specific about Classico. I like some of the other uh, outside uh, zones of Chianti as well, but uh, usually I find the best consistency and quality in Chianti Classico. So I'm really excited to um, uh, speak about this with you. With my uh, partner in crime here, this is Ron Edwards, our uh, Director of Wine Education for Winebow and fellow Master Sommelier. Ron. Hey. It's good to be back again this week. Um, this is Between Two Psalms, and we're going to bounce back and forth on ideas and, and thought processes and maybe even some real facts instead of just legends uh, <laughs> about this uh, very uh, old and classic region that indeed has so much to talk about, some, and just a whole lot of confusion, I think, basically in the marketplace. So we're going to try and help you with some of that, too. Cool. Uh, well, uh, just to just to let you know, um, we've got some pretty pretty nice vintages to, uh, that we're working with right now, currently uh, in the market. Uh, especially, you know, fifteen and sixteen vintages um, were really great. I mean, they had great great press, uh, and some of those wines, especially, I think the sixteen should be really long lived. So, two really nice vintages, uh, a challenging vintage in seventeen and small, but um, actually, when you look at the reviews and things, um, the wines, uh, a lot of the top producers uh, did really well in the press. Um, I, I actually really loved the, the 13 vintage, um, mm -hmm. lots of freshness and acidity and more elegance in that vintage. But um, just to let you know, there's a lot of uh, great wine in the market right now from some really terrific vintages. Yeah, and I think that this that list sort of reflects what we kind of expect out of Chianti Classico. It's a very consistent region. Um, sometimes maybe that works against it in some ways, sort of like well, there's not as much, if you don't have tragedy to talk about, maybe you don't have triumph either, but they, they really balance, make good wine all the time. And so that's one of the reasons it's a go-to region, right? It's like, yeah. well, I don't remember that vintage. I'll buy it anyway. It's from Chianti Classico. Yeah. Um, well, Ron, we have just a little bit of history we need to unpack when we start talking about uh, Chianti, uh, Chianti Classico. Um, you know, uh, it's a very, very old uh, winemaking place. I mean, certainly uh, wine, wine was here before Roman times, uh, but, uh, but it, things really start to, uh, I think, get interesting um, 18th century. But uh, the Lega del Chianti, 1384, uh, maybe share a little info about what that is. Sure. You know, they, uh, they, there was this battle that kept going back and forth between Firenze and Siena as to who would control the area in between. It was already important agricultural and viticultural land. And so they, they eventually formed the Lega del Chianti to delineate who had what. And it was, it's a very interesting story of how it happened. And that's how the rooster comes into being. And uh, it seems that uh, Siena cheated a little bit and uh, hid their rooster in the dark for several days and didn't feed him. So he came out and started crowing long before dawn. And they ended up with the lion's share prior to uh, when they actually put in a legal definition later in time. But and, uh, lots in, of great legend. In 1716, Cosimo III de' Medici um, uh, put up this decree uh, that um, actually defined what we would now call the Chianti Classico area. So um, those original villages of Chianti Classico were, uh, were sort of uh, de de defined in a decree. So Castellina, um, uh, Greve. Uh, so uh, that's a very important moment in time. And then I think very importantly also 1872, uh, Baron Bettino uh, Ricasole um, happened after uh, research um, declares that this Chianti formula, which, um, which really, I mean, sort of, I mean, of course, it seems like it's always mm -hmm. evolving a little bit, but uh, it's really sort of been um, that since, since then. It's, yeah, and, he, and he created the two versions of it, right? And the one we see published a lot is the one that sort of got Chianti in a little bit of trouble by allowing too much white wine long-term. But he also, from that very point on, knew that great wine from this region was going to have to have 
most of its componentry out of Sangiovese. Sangiovese, yeah. Um, Chianti Classico Consortium is founded in 1924, uh, and, and this is a really sort of in response to um, some of the uh, not so great um, Chianti that was being, being produced. So to sort of protect this original zone of production, this uh, consortium was uh, founded. Um, maybe, uh, maybe speak a little bit about the fiasco, um, which probably um, uh, probably first appeared what in the 30s or 40s, uh, but this um, this sort of uh, unusual bottle shape that I think for a lot of people, um, you know, brings nice feelings of, of nostalgia. It's a real sort of symbol of Italian American heritage, but on the other hand, uh, something that um, is a, it's part of the image uh, difficulties that Chianti has had to overcome. Yeah, I, I can't see one without thinking of the song from Billy Joel, Italian Restaurant. So <laughs> I have my own imagery of it, but it does sort of have a symbol of, of exactly what you said, but also the struggles that Chianti and Chianti Classico go through in the marketplace because of mistakes in marketing or um, intentionality on some people's part of putting out a product that was a little more bulk and a little less quality. And, you know, we got a question earlier today about that that we can address a little deeper later. But the idea of being able to walk into a store and find Chianti Classico from $50 a bottle to 13 is really confusing to the customer. And this is sort of emblematic of that struggle right here. Yeah. Um, so fiasco means flask came about because, uh, you know, Italian glass was not as strong uh, as glass that was being used elsewhere. So it's, um, it's uh, protected in this little uh, basket. Um, and uh, it's the kind of, I suppose, the kind of Chianti that my, my parents would have drank. And, you know, you put the candle in it afterwards. Uh, but um, but uh, let's keep going here. So 1932, the Italian government um, expands this uh, production zone of Chianti. So um, we are now um, expanding outside of this original zone of production. These, um, these seven uh, zones of Chianti are established. Um, and so it's, it's growing uh, in part due to, um, to market demand. Um, and uh, 1967, Chianti Classico um, get earn, or Chianti, I should say, uh, earns uh, this DOC with the Classico just being designated as a subzone. Very interesting there. Um, so that's the entirety of the Chianti re region uh, gets its DOC in 1967. Um, the uh, DOCG. Um, comes about in Chianti, for Chianti in 1984. Eventually, the Classico would have its own um, separate uh, appellation or uh, separate DOCG. Um, and in 1989, uh, we see uh, the producers in Chianti Classico uh, embark on this very massive, very ambitious project to improve the quality and ultimately the image of Chianti Classico with this Chianti Classico 2000 project. Yep. And I, I think that that was smart move on their part. And the, the work I think is going to, is, has already paid off and will continue to pay off because they've put themselves in a position where they can uh, live beyond old reputations and exceed the reputation of Chianti so labeled, not, not from Classico. Um, and, you know, they can capitalize on the idea that this is an easily rememberable term. Classico is something like, you know, I would say, 40% of wine drinkers in America already have heard this term and are comfortable with it, as opposed to a lot of the other stuff we'd like to introduce. So I think they have an advantage here, but tell them all about it. Well, the real, um, the real point of this was to improve uh, best practices in the vineyard. Um, and a big part of this was to um, find uh, the best clones. And they started with a, a lot, very large number of Sangiovese clones. Sangiovese, by the way, is very prone to, to mutation. And um, you, you have uh, different uh, clone, clone types that, um, were, that were developed either for, um, for quantity or, or for quality. And they all sort of express something a little bit different. So starting with 239 clones, whittled it down to um, seven that are recognized as really the, this the very best, uh, but also viticultural practices here are studied, and um, it's uh, it's really part, a big part of the um, progress that uh, Chianti Classico has made because of this massive endeavor, the Chianti Classico 2000 project. Yeah, and you know one of the things that they came to was not only is it clonal selection, but we're going to reduce yields. We're mm -hmm. not going to allow people to just make all kinds of huge quantity of wine, so it's significantly lower than than Chianti, its next door neighbor, and. 
and one of the other ways I've heard this discussed was the idea that any of our old grape varieties, very old domesticated grape varieties, tend to have a lot of clones laying around. And um, I've heard it said and said it myself, you know, they tend to mutate. And then I read some other things that, well, maybe it wasn't actually mutation so much as it is just that it's so old that there were just variants always around uh, because of the course of time. Um, but Pinot Noir is like this. Chardonnay has a lot of mutation, mutation um, and Sangiovese is certainly a lot like that too. 90, 96 County um, becomes its own separate uh, DOCG with its own set of, of uh, rules. Um, and in 2006, finally, we see these white grapes being banned from Chianti Classico. Yeah. I think that's, that's huge. That's important uh, because um, probably in this zone um, uh, several hundred years ago, there were probably a lot more white grapes uh, to be found. And it was always part of the, the Chianti yeah. formula. Um, uh, so finally in 2006, there's no more Trebbiano, Malvasia, that, that sort of thing. And, you know, the reality is that when it was first designed to have white wine in it, it was designed to have Malvasia in it. And Malvasia is going to act a little bit like Viognier with Syrah. It's going to add a little skin tannin. It's going to add a little aromatic pop. It's going to fix color. But, you know, as the course of time went on, yeah, there was a lot more gr white grapes planted, but they became more and more Trebbiano, which added nothing to the blend other than volume. And um, so this was one of the most important things that's happened certainly in our lifetimes for Chianti was that Classico saying, no, 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 we're not, we're just not going to do white grapes anymore. We don't need them. We have other options. Probably the biggest um, uh, development here is this introduction of a new category uh, within Chianti Classico and it's called Gran Selezione, um, which uh, was uh, um, established in 2014. Um, and we'll, we're going to unpack that uh, a little bit because I think it's worth uh, spending a little bit of time on. But of course, um, Chianti Classico, really Tuscany, the grape of Tuscany is Sangiovese. We already mentioned um, prone to mutation, so there's a lot of different clones out there. Uh, but Sangiovese, I think generally it should be described as, um, uh, it, to me, it's a thin skinned variety, um, you know, on its own, 100% Sangiovese, you can usually see right through the wine, so not a wine of great uh, color or uh, concentration, uh, but you get this really, for me, classically, it's red fruited and it's specifically tart red fruit. Um, the classic descriptor is always this Morello cherry, but this sour red cherry uh, character. Um, always for me, a lot of uh, sort of savory herbs to it. Um, and then it's, it, you just start thinking like, well, it's a little like oregano, a little <laughs> uh, bay leaf and sage. So some of these um, herbs that we might use in, a, in Italian cooking, they, they sort of come to mind easily. Uh, high acid, um, that is for sure uh, something that um, always takes me in a blind tasting. I start thinking about Sangiovese when I get this high acidity. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, since we're speaking about blind tasting, I'm very easily uh, confused with uh, Nebbiolo. We see it all the time, like in our exams and things. But it, Sangiovese, while it has tannin, it doesn't have that, um, that sort of just uh, gripping um, sort of dehydrating tannin that, that Nebbiolo has. So it's, it's, those are two real distinctions between the, the two varieties. Yeah, when, when in doubt, um, ask yourself at the end, am I left with any water in my mouth or not? Because if, you're, if your mouth has any salivation still going on, you're probably not classic Nebbiolo. There's yeah. always lightweight Nebbiolo where the tannin's been reduced by winemaking method, but in a classic format, those wines are just going to be drying to the extreme. And, and Sangiovese leaves you a little bit more invited to have another sip. Your mouth is still watering, the tannin's there, but it's washed away by the acidity as opposed to the, um, the almost panzer tank attack of a, of a Nebbiolo approach on the palate. Um, and yeah, I'm totally right there with you on the flavor profiles. It's all centered around cherry for me. And that's the other thing with Nebbiolo, it tends to be broader ranged in its fruit spectrum. It, cherry will be there, but there'll be a lot of other stuff. And I tend to see that Nebbiolo tends to have a more dried fruit approach, a little bit yeah. less fresh fruit. 
I think because of the um, uh, classically high acidity that San Giovese has, it has some, some blending partners here that are meant to do different things. For example, uh, Canaiolo Nero is uh, supposed to soften the tannins and sort of uh, bring some fruitiness and fleshiness to the wine. Colorino, a tainturier variety, that just means that it has a, a colored uh, flesh or juice. Um, so obviously used for, for color. Um, well, it's still true that uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, some international varieties are allowed uh, in uh, Chianti Classico. Um, and I, I think this brings me to a point I wanted to make about Sangiovese. Um, I think one of the things I really love about the variety is it's, it really uh, very clearly expresses terroir, in my opinion. So mm -hmm. it's another one of those varieties like Pinot Noir or, um, or Syrah that um, to me is really um, uh, expressive of the place in which it, it's grown. And uh, uh, I would say maybe about these Cabernet, these international grapes, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, when it comes to Sangiovese, just a little bit goes a long way. So they really sort of um, uh, take over the, the taste and the profile of the wine. So um, I think a, a trend uh, that I've noticed in, um, in Tuscany and Chianti Classico uh, is to um, work more on Sangiovese um, and, and maybe a less of these um, blending varieties, especially the international ones. But, and I think that's a, a great thing because uh, I think Sangiovese is a beautiful one on its own. Yeah, they've had so much success with the IGTs, you know, the Super Tuscans and being able to blend it in whatever percentage they wanted. And they no longer need that to show off Sangiovese because the law allows them to show off Sangiovese even at 100% in Chianti Classico. So yeah. Yeah, I think the future is that those dominant blends, which for me, anytime you get to 15% of something else in Sangiovese that like Cabernet or, or Merlot or Cab Franc, you're changing that a lot. There's yeah. just, it's just not, it's too transparent on its own. And so anything muddles it pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and um, I agree with you. I'd rather see Sangiovese by itself or almost by itself because it, it's so translucent in exactly what it expresses. And we've got a, a question here from Bill. This seems like a good point. Throw it in there. Uh, were the white grapes used to soften the tannins of Sangiovese back in the day because winemaking had not been modernized and tannin management was not known yet in Italy? I I, I think actually from what the history that I read, there was just more, there were more white grape varieties there historically. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, well, probably was 17th century or something, some period there where we start, started to see more and more uh, red varieties. So I think there's a, there's a historic reason that white grapes were there. But uh, as far as what they contribute, um, you brought up the point that um, Mal Malvasia maybe helps set color or that, um, you know, um, uh, contributes something structurally there. Uh, Trebbiano, I don't know. It's it's really just there as a, a filler as far as I, I'm aware. Well, and you also look back at ancient wines, the most prized of the ancient wines and, and even medieval wines were usually residual sugar, powerful, you know, the, a lot of air dried grapes going on in those days because they needed to make sure things were ripe and they also valued sugar more than as much as we do today, but they had little access to it. So we kind of think of why would they do that in modern terms? Cause it doesn't make sense, but the style of wine now is not really relevant to the style of wine in say 1200 or uh, 1300 when the, a lot of these things started to evolve. They're, they're just very different. And, and so the reason white goes away in these red blends is because we don't want that style of wine anymore. Like, like I was studying Portugal and, the, and that wine that was invented uh, in uh, Lisboa area that is actually uh, two thirds white and one third red. And then they put it and finish aging it together because that was refreshing and ageable and it didn't go bad in the cellar and it had lots of reasons for it then, but now it's a wine of antiquity. Mm. Well, um, I'm always a stickler when I'm speaking about Chianti with, with, with anyone, consumers, uh, fellow uh, sommeliers in the trade. I'm always a stickler about uh, making people say, "Is it? are we speaking of Chianti? Are we speaking of Chianti Classico? And I suppose it's a little bit annoying, but um, uh, to me, uh, they're very distinct uh, uh, appellations. And so um, just to get our bearings here, this is the uh, DOCG uh, rules, I guess, for Chianti. Uh, which there's, so you can see in the map there, it's quite a bit larger area than the original zone of production. The Classico area is the uh, area in red there be between Firenze and Siena. Uh, there's about 7,200 hectares uh, within the Classico area planted. And then the rest of Chianti uh, is 
an, an additional 20,000 or so. Um, and you'll see that these, um, these um, rules of the appellation um, are not really so different than um, Chianti Classico. Uh, you can still use white grapes. Um, there's a, a little higher percentage with other uh, varieties that are allowed to be blended with, uh, used with Sangiovese, a little higher uh, yields. Oh, we, we did get a question um, from uh, Deb via email. She wanted to know about this Governo process that she had read mm -hmm. about. Um, you know, it's still, you can use this uh, process in uh, Chianti, um, you do need to state it on the label. Uh, but let's talk about this and what this is, because I, I think people are sometimes interested in this. This is um, Governo, um, and uh, it is a, it's an old technique of, um, I think, mainly a, a, a way of um, helping it maybe a stuck stuff fermentation or to sort mm -hmm. of kickstart um, malolactic fermentation. Uh, but what you do is you, um, you take a, a very small percentage of dried grapes um, and you introduce that to the, the fermenting uh, must and uh, it gives it a little, a little kick, a little boost, um, but it also um, increases the alcohol, um, increases the body of the wine, and it's probably going to leave behind a little bit of residual sugar too. This is really uncommon. I saw a, um, uh, an article when researching this um, this week uh, that there's only like four governos that even come into the US, so mm -hmm. it's very, very uncommon. Yeah, I, I can't remember seeing one actually. Um, yeah. And, you know, it's, it's very typical across Italy, though, the air drying of grapes and sure. making wine in it is, is kind of universal in every region in one form or another. And when you think of the history of how winemaking developed, it was considered food and uh, an essential part, just like beer making was considered an essential part of your everyday caloric intake. And so if there was any risk whatsoever that you might lose your harvest to bad weather or, you know, I just don't want to... I, all the peasants are available now, however it worked, you might just let them lay around and air dry a little while. And then all of a sudden you found out, wow, I like that wine. It's more powerful, like the accidental creation of Botrytis dessert wines, right? It wasn't, sure. it wasn't like they planned it. It just had a good result. And they're like, well, let's do that again. I think Governo and uh, Ripasso and Amarone processes, I think they all sort of, sort, sort of came from that direction. Um, yeah. And on we go. Well, uh, so let's look at um, Chianti Classico, which uh, separated from the rest of Chianti 96 with its own DOCG. Um, so it's anywhere from 80 to 100% Sangiovese um, with, uh, with, of course, uh, some of these other red grapes uh, allowed um, and uh, no, whites, no white grapes permitted since the 06 vintage, just slightly uh, lower uh, yield here. Um, but um, uh, it's these are these are Sangiovese base wines. Now, in addition to, um, I, I guess we would, I call that normale, uh, and uh, it's just out of habit. I've always called like the the basic, the classic Chianti Classico, which is actually my favorite style. Uh, is I call it normale. Uh, but um, we also have these other categories, which are kind of kind of like uh, selections in the cellar, right? Um, you're making a selection of probably um, the best uh, barrels or best um, uh, uh, fermenting vats uh, to produce Reserva, uh, which uh, just requires longer minimum aging. Um, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a slightly higher minimum level of alcohol here, but it has to age for a minimum of 24 months. And I think it's a really good point that that doesn't necessarily have to be in oak, but uh, you, you find that a lot of them are. Um, a lot of that's oftentimes what a, a reserve is. It's, it's a, uh, where the uh, producer is using some new oak. Yeah, and Sangiovese, like Nebbiolo, benefits from oxidative wine aging um, by nature of softening tannins. And so it's been traditional and, um, and it makes sense, but the law doesn't require it. It just, but it does require at least three months in the bottle. So you get to mix it up pretty liberally as you feel as a winemaker. And I thought it was, it was very interesting. Some of our LLS team is on, on the um, webinar today and they pinged us to let us know that uh, Castellare has a governo that's out there oh, for availability wow. and that we can get it custom uh, like a special order. So that's, that's really awesome. I'm, cool. I might have to do that just so I can try it. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Gran Selezione, um, which uh, was approved in the 2014 vintage for wines beginning with 2010. Uh, and uh, this is a new category. And 
This is a this is one that um, uh, sometimes brings back brings about a little bit of um, controversy because um, uh, producers had uh, mixed feelings about uh, introducing this new category. Some were really for it, others wanted to go a different direction. Nonetheless, this category exists as part of the DOCG. Um, it, it I think the most important thing to say here is that um, it does require that the the fruit is all estate grown, uh, which is a positive thing. However, um, this doesn't necessarily mean that the vineyards have to be anywhere near each other. They could be from different communes or different parts of the Chianti Classico uh, area. So, uh, but estate grown fruit, um, usually a good marker of quality, a little bit longer aging. Um, you know, again, I don't know that um, Sangiovese necessarily uh, needs this longer aging, but anyway, that's what it is. Um, and uh, what are some of the, I guess, um, you know, when I said that, that it sort of brings about this, controversy, um, at least when it was being developed, and I think people are, are still discussing it. Um, it's because Gran Selezione is really a different sort of idea than I think what we've seen elsewhere in the wine world where, um, you know, Germany or um, Austria or even Piedmont uh, have really um, put into place systems that um, promote their terroirs. Uh, so um, this is not necessarily an idea that's tied to the land. Uh, it is more about um, it's more about making a sort of super category. Uh, in a way, it's kind of like a, a super reserva, I guess. It, it's a selection, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that um, it's interesting to me that they've sort of approached the the idea a little bit like Gran Reserva in Spain. And I feel like Tuscany aligns pretty well with Bordeaux, where really they have not ever, other than commune, which is kind of a, Kevin sent us a question about CC zones based on soil type, or are they just political? And they're really essentially political based on villages because the soil is sort of mixed in and out and there's some elevation changes. And we're gonna talk about how the villages are actually different, but they didn't build the laws around, well, that soil type's over here and that elevation's over here per se. Right. It's a little bit like Bordeaux. It's like, here's a commune. Here's a great producer in this commune. So we're going to ratify the producer and then associate him with the commune is kind of the way I see Chianti Classico has developed. And so this uh, Selezione is sort of an extension of that because it's an elevation of the producer more so than the individual vineyard. I, but I think in the end, as time goes by, they're going to be forced down the path to to start elevating some of these single great vineyard sites as much as they are aging requirements and anything else and um, delineating themselves very clearly in the marketplace as there is Chianti and there is Chianti Classico and mm -hmm. they are different and there you should expect different things from them and there are different price points which we're struggling with still today because of you know things like Aldi and Trader Joe's can go out and buy five, five uh, fermentation vats full of wine, pay up front for it, have it bottled and make a few pennies per bottle on mass and be happy with it while a legitimate producer, well, that's, that's probably the wrong way to put it. A, a, an actual domain has to make their money after aging the wine and everything else. And it really confuses the marketplace. Well, and uh, to, to your point, Ron, um, the, the, that's why I have this uh, bullet point here about this this crew crew concept. I think mm -hmm. has always sort of been strong in Piedmont. They they view their um, their approach, I guess, is uh, very sort of Burgundian in a way. And here, as you mentioned, uh, it's it's almost more Bordeaux like in the in the uh, the mindset, I guess. Uh, and and that really um, sort of goes against what I was saying when I said it's uh, Sangiovese is very expressive of mm -hmm. site and terroir. Uh, it just seems to me, I, it's my own opinion. But it just seems to me that um, it's the is a great candidate uh, as a variety uh, and this place to um, to have a system based more on terroir than this, I guess, selection. But anyway, that's the rabbit hole there. Yeah. Um, this is too. This is too. Um, uh, the, these soil things are always so um, uh, too mm -hmm. simple to put into a presentation like this. But right. there's, um, you know, this galestro is very uh, prized. Um, you know, this sort of uh, calcareous, very rocky uh, soil that you find in, in certain parts of the Classico zone. Um, sort of in the south, you might find uh, this other soil, um, Alberese, or it's sandstones, really. Um, so maybe more um, generally more broad, rich, maybe even powerful wines on the Alberese sandstone. And then you get more, um, maybe more nuance from the, the Galestro and other areas. 
Yeah, and don't be surprised, folks, if you go out and you look these two soils up and you get different descriptions of them. Uh, I looked them up in several different places today, got conflicting reports uh, settled in on uh, maybe the uh, the geologist guide to wine on it and I'll just leave it out there for all of you to go look it up because it's like a lot of things in Italy a little hard to pin down sometimes. All right um, so let's look at some of these uh, villages uh, because this is what I, I find this uh, really really interesting about Chianti Classico and I think um, I think this as you said Ron maybe this is the uh, the mm -hmm. way forward um, yeah. you know when we think about where do we go from here uh, we can look at Castellina for example which is um, always uh, so sort of the descriptor you always read about is the, always the most fine and precise in terms of aroma and flavor maybe the, one of the more elegant uh, communes of the Chianti Classico lots of galestro here slightly mm -hmm. lower altitude um, um, Castel Nuevo, Baradenga in the south, um, you, uh, I think of that as like usually this is where we find that, um, that sandstone soil. It's warmer uh, there in the south, so um, you get uh, more ripeness, um, very rich uh, flavors. Um, so then uh, we might look at Gaoli, very interesting, um, this commune. So uh, Gaoli, so not only are there some really excellent uh, producers based here, uh, but um, uh, lots of, it's high in elevation, um, lots of this galester soil, very structured wines with firm tannins. You even um, here have this, we, I have this term here, frazione. Um, here we're even seeing uh, not just, we're not just speaking about the commune of Gaoli itself, but actually a, a district within the, the commune. So we're getting uh, more to this idea of single vineyard or, or true uh, level here. And um, there, are, there are producers that um, have made a case for this being, uh, you know, Grand Cru level of um, this uh, a Frazione of Monti. Um, <clears throat> Rada, again, uh, uh, some high elevation vineyards here, um, structured, lots of uh, excellent producers in Rada. Uh, Monte Verdine, one of my favorites, is here. Um, and uh, Greve, another one, really interesting one to speak about here. Um, concentrated wines you have yet, yeah, and, and here's a place where, um, I, again, you make this really strong case for. Um, for this, maybe this idea of cruise, uh, because you already have um, the producers in this very particular uh, frazione or a uh, commune uh, Panzano within Greve um, who are labeling their wines as such, pa uh, Panzano or La Mole here as well. Yeah, and, um, and they have good reason for it. You know, that, that, that vineyard site slash village is like in this bowl of sun exposure, sort of like what we think of, yep. think of the Mosul, how in certain places it just curves out and all of a sudden it's this beautiful amphitheater. And this is, this is the answer to several questions that came up and it's like, okay, can they do a cruise system here? They could at the very minimum start elevating certain villages with their quality and start naming by village as a first point, even if they didn't start doing single vineyards, you know. Greve is where you find Poggio Scaletti, Castel del Bossi is down there in um, uh, Castel, du, Castel Nuovo, uh, Berdenga, right? Uh, yes. And then Castellari, Castellari is easy because it has it right there on the label, Castellina. But uh, there's several, there's some other questions here, like um, people are a little, well, there is, is, this is part of the issue with the market, right? Is Gran Selezione, what does it mean? And our people on our call are struggling with that too. And, you know, we list it and you can look it up on Guildsom and it's like, well, it requires 13% alcohol by volume and it requires it to be a state fruit. Um, so then the questions come up, well, are there older vines required or uh, is it just, it, I thought fruit quality was involved and all of that stuff. And um, so do you have any answers for those real quick? It, I think if uh, Gran Selezione is going to be a, a, this, um, this long-term success for the Chianti Classico, um, we, we have to, they have to, the consortium has to communicate to the market that it's, um, that it's, uh, it can't just be those, those rules of its production. It has to be, the market has to understand, the consumer has to understand that this is the, the top selection uh, from the, the estate. Um, that, uh, and, and to answer the question about old vines, there's, there's nothing in any literature that I've found that says that it requires old vines. Uh, it doesn't even, the vineyards don't even have to be 
uh, contiguous. They could be from different zones. Uh, so there's, there's still not this real um, idea of tying quality to the land with Gran Selezione, but uh, if this is their, their long-term um, idea to promote and to raise the profile of Chianti Classico, I think they have to make that really, really clear to the market. So what does it mean? And um, from what I can uh, sort of discern about it is that they've created a, um, a, a super sort of crew or um, almost like a super reserve, a category. Uh, it, and it's, I suppose, not unlike Grosses Gewächs in Germany. However, Grosses Gewächs, a super category, if you want, is it, it ties it to the land. It, it, by definition, has to come from one of the BDP's Grand Cru vineyards. So again, it's not, not, not quite um, connecting to terroir, I think, in the way that it, it, it should. Yeah, it's really, really, I think it's more about ageability. It's like, hey, here's a great wine. We're going to prove it because it's ageable. It's very similar to the, you know, Rioja Gran Reserve model. It's like, this wine is so good, we're going to age it extra for you and then let you have it because if we gave it to you right now, you drink it too early kind of kind of model. Uh, we have a, a question here from Namor about the different Sangiovese clones. And uh, sh I'm not sure what discussion she's in. I don't get into too many Sangiovese clone discussions. I'm, I'm but... The idea, uh, I'm going to start it with this myth that Brunello and Prugnolo and Grosso and Morlino were actually completely different clones and they have dispelled that now that they are genetically identical. So, you know, there's a lot of misinformation alongside of information. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm glad you brought that up because um, it's, it's, it's all Sangiovese Grosso these days. I mean, we're t when we're talking about the, the premium end of the market, it's Sangiovese uh, Grosso, uh, but, uh, but uh, Sangiovese being prone to, to mutating and whatever, uh, there, are, there are variations on that, but um, the, the quality clone these days is Sangiovese Grosso. I know that you read old references of uh, Sangiovese Piccolo. It's, it's really, in, at least with Chianti Classico, that's really not part of the uh, discussion anymore. Yeah, and they actually did trials between Piccolo and Grosso because it was reputed that Piccolo would actually make better wines. And the reality they found was that wasn't really true. Um, I think that Tuscany is very much like a lot of other places. Great winemakers and great vineyard managers make great wines. And uh, it's not the clone of Sangiovese that's making the real difference there. Uh, do you want to address Rich's question? It's a deep one. Uh, we, might have to, we might have to lean on an LLS person for that one. Uh, yeah, all I can say there is that he's asking about the, um, the claim of one of our producers here, really excellent producer, Poggio Scalette, um, with their, their um, Il Carbonione vineyard. Uh, and it's, uh, it has this, um, what they refer to as the, the mother clone, uh, La Mole. Um, and uh, what, what is that all about? Um, I think by mother clone, we're talking about um, maybe a, a heritage clone, like something that's been there uh, for a very, very long time that's not necessarily, that's not been developed in any, um, any kind of nursery or anything, uh, but a, um, a very old clone that the, the producer claims to be a, an original clone of Sangiovese, Sangiovese Grosso. Yeah, I don't think it's about the clone in that case. I really think in his particular case, it's about that really unique vineyard that's got all of that uh, carbon-based rock from, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically burning stuff. It's a very different, it's almost like a, a potash-driven vineyard, and I think that's what it's really all about there, more so than it is about, you could put Grosso in there, and it would probably produce a very, very similar wine. Um, all right, so uh, yes, there is, uh, Rich also brought up the idea of between confusing between biotypes and clonal types, and we just don't have enough time, and I don't have enough expertise to even get into that personally, um, but uh, if you want to deal with it, that's great. Otherwise, um, it might be time to announce what we're doing next week. Uh, we are going to look at um, Western Australia, specifically Margaret River. I'm very uh, excited about that. Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, so um, we have put together our program for May uh, and we will be um, announcing that to the world uh, very shortly with, um, with uh, four new upcoming topics that uh, we, we want to talk about. And so uh, Ron, one of the reasons we talked about Chianti Classico today is because I love drinking Chianti Classico. So we're, we're definitely um, high spotting our, some of our favorite wines with these, um, with these between two psalm uh, sessions. Obviously, we did. We covered Chris and Ron's one of the, the great experts there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, uh, Margaret River, very interesting. Um, uh, 
lot of boutique quality producers uh, based there, a lot of good wine coming out of uh, Margaret River. So yep. we're going to go New World next week. Absolutely, as we should. We should never be accused that the New World doesn't, doesn't suit us. It's, uh, <laughs> there's some great wines in the New World that you and I both like. Margaret River is one of those places that is, um, you know, always talked about, but not necessarily understood well. And certainly, if we lead the conversation with the word Australia, we often get a, a turned off look from our buyers and customers. But it's, I mean, that's like saying wine from America. That's just not, you know, and we'll talk about it next week. But it's just like, well, did you just say I want to sell you an Italian wine? Come on. There are regions to be talked about everywhere. And uh those are important factors. I'm looking forward to that conversation for sure. Yeah, and uh, we've got a lot of other uh, great topics coming up in the month of May and keep your feedback uh, coming because um, we have listened to uh, your ideas and suggestions also and um, have uh, tried to uh, incorporate uh, as many of those topics as we can into these, uh, these discussions. So um, very good, fun, fun uh, topic. Thank you so much, Ron. We really appreciate um, you taking the time to uh, uh, talk about Chianti Classico, one of my favorite wines today. And uh, uh, thank you uh, everyone for attending. Absolutely, you've made me very thirsty, Jesse. I, I hope that everybody else can go find a bottle of Chianti to satisfy that urge. Thanks everybody, have a great, great rest of your day. Thank you.